Good morning and welcome to week two of the spatial, Space and Geospatial Virtual Pavilion for COP26 organised by the KTN. It's great to see so many people joining us live and also a belated welcome to those of you who will be watching as part of the catch up service. My name is Dr Mark Harrison and I'm head of UK Applied Science at the Met Office. I've had the pleasure of organising the session with Professor Sarah Lindley from the Department of Geography at the University of Manchester and also Dr Alistair Ford, who's a lecturer in geospatial data analytics in the geospatial engineering group at Newcastle University. Before I go on, I should also uh, thank Luca and, and Anita for organising the event. I know how much time and effort this sort of thing takes. So back in the spring, the Met Office ran a couple of hackathons or a number of hackathons uh, in conjunction with our six academic partners. You can read more about these events on my LinkedIn page, should you so wish. But each of the events brought together people from different backgrounds with different expertise, with expertise using different data sets. And over the course of a few days, they pulled together their shared experience to combine data to develop some initial climate service prototypes. A central theme that ran through the team's work was the importance of location or a geospatial element. So when we were offered the opportunity to convene a session during this virtual pavilion, we jumped at the chance. So in terms of this session itself, we've got four main speakers who will be sharing some of their experiences as providers of climate information. These projects are all part of the UK Climate Resilience Programme. This programme has been funded through the Strategic Priorities Fund and operationalised through the Met Office and UKRI. If you're interested in learning more about this, then please check out the UK Climate Resilience web pages. I'll be chairing the first session. There will be the opportunity to ask speakers any clarifying questions specific to their presentations, but please hold the majority of your thoughts for the panel discussion later on. After this, Sarah will be sharing her thoughts on how geospatial data can be used to inform decision making. Sarah intends to use Menti to make this part interactive, so I'm looking forward to seeing people's responses. And in the second half, we'll see Alistair chair a panel discussion that features guests who will bring more of a user perspective. Unfortunately, we've had a couple of panellists drop out at the last minute, so we've decided to include some of the initial presenters in this discussion as well. So the panel discussion will comprise both climate service providers and also climate service users. The success of this panel session is really dependent on you as the audience, so please sharpen your pencils and keep note of questions to ask. Okay, so that's enough from me. Um, first up, I'd like to welcome Rachel Parks from the Met Office. Rachel has many years of experience working as a coastal modeler, both in the private sector and also here at the Met Office. During her presentation, she'll be discussing the project that she's been leading that aims to develop tools to improve coastal resilience. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Mark. Sorry for switching screens there last minute. I forgot to turn on my microphone before entering into the presentation. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the impacts of sea level rise on the UK coast. Um, but before I go into sort of the details of my project, I wanted to sort of just give a bit of a background as to why sort of sea level rise matters. So there have been a number of reports produced by the IPCC and here at the UK Met Office. The most recent of these is AR6, the physical science basis. And it states that relative sea level rise contributes to an increase in the frequency and the severity of coastal flooding all over the globe. So this is really important to sort of think about as we go forwards through this presentation. So I found this really nice schematic in one of the IPCC reports, and it sort of highlights all of the different components that lead to sea level rise. This can be from sort of the ocean properties, thinking about sort of the ocean density and how this can affect the column height of the water. The ice sheet dynamics, so the melting of sort of the ice sheets and the shelves, as well as glaciers, 
leading to a contribution of mass into the sea, as well as changes to sort of properties on land. So changes to the hydrological cycle and how much precipitation falls on land, as well as groundwater extraction. Now, each of these different processes uh, affect sort of the sea level at different spatial scales. So I've managed to find this sort of really nice schematic here that explains sort of the contributions at the global level. So the contribution from thermal expansion, the heating of the water and the increase sort of to the volume, as well as the melting of sort of glaciers and ice sheets. And then the contributions at the regional level, so the changes to ocean circulation um, and density, as I've mentioned before, as well as changes to sort of land ice water storage on land and the glacial isostatic adjustment. So these processes at the global level, at the regional level, all combine together to form the time mean sea level projections that you'll see in many of the reports I mentioned. And this, alongside the tides and the surges and waves, all affect the local sea level or extremes that we might experience in our communities around the coast. So as part of the project that I've been working on, looking at sort of coastal risk, We've developed a relocatable sea level tool, which will provide the regional sea level projections for anywhere across the globe. These are derived from the climate model simulations from the coupled model into comparison project phase five or CMIP five for those of you that know. And I've got an example plot here at the bottom that sort of shows you the um, projections that you get out of the tool. So the left subplot here is showing the global projections from the tool and as the validation it compares these against the IPCC AR5 projections. And then the right hand subplot here is showing a case study example. So here I'm looking at North Shields on the east coast of the UK. And it compares this against the global projections. So you can see that the sea level projections out to 2100 are increasing slower than the global average for North Shields. But how have we used this tool? So to date, we've used this to respond to a request from the UK government's Ministry of Defence to explore how sea level projections affect coastal risk on the UK mainland and some of the overseas territories. And this has contributed to a report that they've written around climate change and a sustainability strategic approach, which doesn't just look at sea level, it looks at a whole host of climate factors and how this will affect the defence estate. So to look at coastal risk in the UK, the second part of my presentation today is going to look at how this tool of sea level projections has been used alongside an operational tool within the Met Office called Coastal Decider. So this tool is used operationally within the Flood Forecasting Centre and it identifies high impact coastal flooding associated with a subset of specific weather patterns, typically those associated with storm surges. It uses a whole host of geospatial data. The main ones that I've um, indicated on the map and on the slides here are tide gauge data, which can be downloaded from the British Oceanographic Data Centre, as well as wave hindcast data, which is from the Met Office WaveWatch 3 model. So just thinking now about how the sea level projections are combined with this operational tool, I thought the best way to do this today would be to look at a case study. So the case study I've taken is uh, Whitby. There was a coastal flooding event that happened on the 13th of January, 2017. And this was caused by a North Sea storm surge that interacted with the high tides of 5.8 meters. And it combined with waves of up to 6.7 meters or 22 feet. So this was quite a significant event for Whitby that's occurred not too many years ago. And the River Esk actually breached its banks, which is sort of the main contributor to the coastal flood in this location. So what I'm going to feed into now is how this case study might look in the future based on the sea level projections that we've been using alongside the Coastal Decider tool. So the main thing to note is that Coastal Decider links to a subset of weather patterns. So this specific event was linked to weather pattern 14 which was a low pressure over sort of the North Sea or Scandinavia, which resulted in northwesterly winds down the East Coast. So that's important to sort of keep in mind as we go forwards into the next slide. So these plots are typical plots that you get out of the Coastal Decider tool, and they highlight the coastal risk 
and the percentage probability of an event that could be considered a risk. So along the x-axis of these plots, all three of them here, we've got one through 30, which are the 30 distinctive weather patterns that we experience over the UK. And I've just highlighted weather pattern 14 here, which is the pattern that caused the case study that we were looking at previously. So on the far left-hand side, we've got the present day plot. And I'm not sure how well these scale bars are showing. So I've just highlighted the percentage probabilities on the bottom of the slide here. So in the present day, an event like the one that happened in Whitby has a 1.2% chance of occurring and having an impact. But if we combine this with the sea level projections to 2050 using an RCP 4.5 scenario or a medium emissions scenario, this percentage probability is changing to 3.1%. So it's over doubling here. So our risk of flooding is increasing. But then on the far right hand side, it's quite a scary plot here, but these are the sea level projections to 2100 under a high emissions scenario. And for weather pattern 14, there's now a 61.3% chance of this event occurring and having an impact in the region. Now I should mention that these all assume that we do nothing, which I'm sure is not gonna be the case, but there's just something to keep in mind. So how is all of this being used? I've mentioned the work that we've done for the Ministry of Defence, but we're also hoping to partner with the Institute of Mechanical Engineers to look at how sea level projections will uh, impact on sort of coastal defences all across the globe. We've had some early discussions with the National Trust and the RNLI to look at how this coastal risk work might be used in sort of their climate work that they're doing. And we've had ongoing discussions with the Environment Agency with to do with sea level projections, coastal risk and also storm surges. But as you can see, I've got a small sort of empty space here on my slide. So I'm really keen to partner with anybody that's interested in using this going forwards. So I'll finish there and I'll just leave my contact details on the slide um, along with the Climate Resilience website. Um, so if anybody wants to get in touch, then please do so. And you can do so through any of these means. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's a great presentation. Um, so next up, our second speaker is Professor Andrew Charlton Perez from Reading University. His main area of research has been considering the interactions between the stratosphere and the troposphere, which has in turn led to more applied work that has included research of relevance to the energy sector and also the health sector. It was my pleasure to work uh, with Andrew a little bit over the last couple of years uh, on a particular project that he undertook for, he and his team undertook for the UK Climate uh, Resilience Programme. And he'll be speaking about this now, which was essentially looking at um, bringing together health information and climate information. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Mark. Apologies for um, <laughs> the slight combination of, of button presses uh, to, to get here. So yes, uh, I'm gonna be talking um, today about the work that uh, we've been doing uh, with Mark and other colleagues at the Met Office on developing a climate service for health. So hopefully um, it, it's fairly obvious to most people in the audience that um, the, the climate crisis is also a, a health crisis um, and um, in, in many ways, that there have been discussion a, about that and, and will be increasing discussion about that at COP. So we have all seen um, images like this. Um, this, is a, this is a picture from um, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest of the US uh, from the last summer. And, and many people will have read the stories there about um, extreme heat over a prolonged period. Um, and I think what's important to note here is that this is not just a kind of immediate acute health crisis and that it causes um, you know, large amounts of ill health and even mortality, but also it's a, it's a logistical crisis for, for um, authorities in, in affected regions. And so um, you know, bringing together um, heat shelters so that people can have some respite from, from extreme heat um, is, is a complex task that requires um, lots of agencies to work together to move people around who don't necessarily have, have the ability to move to heat shelters to think about how large those shelters need to be, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and I want to just make the case here that this is obviously in, in um, many parts of the world where, where there is already um, heat health risk, then this is, this is a problem as, as temperatures warm, um, but it will also increasingly be a, be a problem for the UK. Um, so if we just look, this is an example um, from the new um, Climate Risk Indicators website, which my colleague Nigel Arnell and others have been developing as part of the same programme. And this is just a, a very simple example, looking at the percentage chance of a, a Met Office heat wave alert. Um, and I've chosen the Thames Valley just because that's where I happen to be, but you could get some of the results um, for, for other parts of the, of the country. Uh, and so we can see this rapid increase in the, in the chance of a, of a heat wave alert. Uh, and as we go into the kind of 2030s and 2040s, not, not too far away, then this is something we should be expecting um, you know, 80% of the time or, or even 90% of the time. Um, and I think it's important to note, obviously, that on this time scale, that there isn't really much scenario uncertainty. So this is under the RCP 8.5 scenario, which is one of the scenarios used in UKCP. But actually, the, the, the real uncertainty that comes from, from the scenario we follow is, is tends to be towards the end of um, the end of the century. So this is um, something we are going to have to prepare for and adapt to. Um, and this is already, in a sense, a, a problem for the UK. Um, so this is an example um, taken from the, the report of um, mortality during 2020 uh, in the UK. And so um, these lines here show uh, the, the kind of the measured mortality, excess mortality during this summer from June through to September. Um, and then we've got the the measures of uh, temperature, Central England temperature here in the in the gold in the gold lines, and so you can see during this um, um, during this this summer there were three periods of, of kind of spikes in temperature above thirty degrees, so typically meeting um, the the definition of a of a heat wave, and you can see that there are um, kind of measurable spikes in mortality in this in this elderly age group sixty five plus associated with those those events. So. Um, uh, you know, just really what I want to make the point there is that this is a logistical challenge. It's one that we face now, uh, and it's one that's only going to get more challenging in the future. So the service that we have been trying to develop starts from um, the kind of standard approaches to um, temperature related epidemiology. Uh, and so what we do at the regional scale uh, across the UK is to take long records of temperature and mortality or hospital admissions. And then we, we try to fit um, relatively complex epidemiological models um, to that data. And this is the result of that fit essentially. So, so these models have a, a number of different dimensions that they look at the impact of um, excess to, uh, of temperature on excess mortality, both in, in a lagged effect. So after people have been exposed to those temperatures uh, but also in terms of the, the temperature that they've been exposed to. Uh, and this just gives you an, an example of, of what the kind of climate looks like here. So this is the relative risk of mortality uh, above um, kind of optimal temperature here, which for Southeast England turns out to be around 18 degrees. And so this has a very characteristic kind of U shape, which any of you who've, who've worked in this, in this field will, will already know. Um, so there's kind of a small increase in mortality at these relatively mild, um, temperatures and then a rapid increase uh, once we drop below around four or five degrees uh, out here into, into very cold temperatures being, being a very large increase in mortality risk and, and the same is true for hospital admissions and then we have this similar rapid increase um, in the health effects um, when we're exposed to temperatures uh, above sort of 25 degrees or so. So what we've done is taken those uh, epidemiological models fitted for uh, recent data, so that the, the most recent 30 years, and then we've used the, the UKCP18 projections to look at how um, the, the stresses that, that occur on the health system will, will change in the future. Um, and so here's, here's um, how one of the ways that we've kind of chosen to, to, to show that result. Um, and I should say, we're not imagining any adaptation here, of course, as um, the population adapts and changes and, and our response to climate changes, then we might expect the structure of this curve to change a bit. But if we assume that this is fixed, um, we can look at, at the kind of changes in uh, attributed deaths per day 
as a function of global mean temperature. And we've plotted for a couple of different scenarios here. So for RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5, and we can explore across the full uh, model space there that we have for UKCP. And you see there are kind of interesting effects here. So for winter, as global mean temperature increases, then you expect a, a small um, uh, decrease in mortality, which is fairly linear uh, across different, different global mean temperature changes and a, and a sharper drop in the, in the highest mortality days. Interestingly, for, for hot temperatures, because of the shape of this curve, um, then, then as we move beyond about two degrees up to kind of four degrees, um, then we see this very kind of uh, strong nonlinearity in terms of the, the impact on our attributed deaths. So um, really there's kind of interesting decision making to be made around the kind of two, two, three degrees global mean uh, temperature changes. Um, so the stresses on the system will increase substantially. Um, when we think about the UK, there are kind of different stresses in winter and summer. So at the moment, winter is definitely our highest current risk. You can see from the shape of the temperature um, histogram here that, that we're kind of in this region quite a lot. Um, and as our population ages, that's not included here, more complex health needs, which we know are affected by cold temperatures, um, then this, this could be a, a kind of an increased effect and a, and a complex um, interaction. So in summer, we have a rapidly increasing risk, as I showed in the previous um, slide, and a kind of rapid increase in system stress. Often when you talk to people in the NHS, they're very aware of the kind of winter stresses that the system is under, but perhaps less so um, the, the summer stresses. And so our service tries to, tries to help to, to start that conversation by having some quantitative um, assessments using, using this method. What we're doing now is, is trying to scale some of that work down to the, the scale of an individual NHS trust. So we're working closely with the Royal Berkshire Foundation Trust in a follow on project. Um, and here's where we get to the kind of more geospatial drivers, where we, we're thinking about the particular setup um, of Reading and its surroundings, which are served by this foundation trust, and how we might help them to prepare for the, for the kind of coming challenges using the work that we've already done. Um, so this is just showing the same kind of plot I, sh I showed in the previous plot, but looking at the different effects in, in different regions of the UK. So you can see there are relatively um, large differences just between different regions based on all sorts of kind of socioeconomic and health uh, inequality effects. So we do need to take this geospatial information into account. What we're trying to do here is to use a combination of the local data that we have about uh, the climate of Reading and how that varies. We're using some um, relatively sophisticated urban modeling techniques to think about um, you know, what, what the meteorology is uh, over the Reading urban area and how that's different in different parts of the town. Um, and then we're obviously using some information um, from, from the, um, the, the health trust about um, health inequalities in, in Reading and how different groups might be affected uh, differently by, by these different extreme temperatures. And I think it's important to note that there are some really important geospatial drivers here. So even in a, a relatively wealthy area like the Thames Valley, there are very substantial health inequalities across Reading, across uh, East Berkshire. And so those play a really important part in, in the, the service that we're gonna eventually provide for the Royal Barks. Um, these differences, as I said, even in a, in a relatively um, small city like Reading, that the urban rural differences can, can be really important. And then this local health data is kind of also really important to thinking about not just the kind of acute effects on health, but also where it is that the, that the trust has limited capacity. So just a few reflections, Mark asked us to give a few reflections based on, on this work. So hopefully uh, you can see that it's kind of clear and obvious um, that we need a, a climate service for health uh, in the UK or an improved climate service for health in the UK. And of course, that's true in, in many, many other countries. Um, I think a, a really key scientific challenge coming into this field um, relatively new is that the finding a spatial and temporal scale at which um, robust defensible conclusions can be drawn, but also one which is useful for decision making is often a challenge. So finding that scale that matches, I think, is, is where we've spent most of our time thinking about. Um, there is obviously this challenge of kind of bringing these different sources of data together, um, uh, you know, and I'm sure Sarah and others will, will talk, and they've done great work in this area, will talk very much about that um, in, in trying to bring health, socioeconomic data, climate data all together in, in one kind of platform where people can just 
go away and do good science is, is a really important step. Um, but I think what we've also found is that there is kind of substantial work that can be done with some quite simple science, even working on quite broad scales, um, just to kind of talk about quantitatively how large these effects are. Uh, and that is a way of kind of engaging those in the health sector with this challenge. Um, and, and again, I come back to this point of kind of winter being something which, you know, we, we hear discussion of very much in the media. I think people in the NHS and, and social care sectors very aware that winter is a huge challenge for them, perhaps, perhaps less so um, for the summer. And I think that greater engagement is really important when we think about another part of the climate service challenge, which is actually just bringing in more of the kind of longer range forecast information on subseasonal or seasonal timescales, where actually there is an opportunity for the, the health and social care sector to do some greater planning um, for, for adaptation. But obviously, we need that quantitative discussion first. So I will stop there. Super, thank you, Andrew. And thank you to those of you who are sending in your questions. I can see there have been some questions already for um, the first presenter. So um, I propose that once all four presenters have um, completed their presentations, we'll go back and uh, address those questions if that's okay. So please keep your questions coming. So next I'd like to introduce uh, John Stenning, who's the Associate Director at Cambridge Econometrics. Uh, John is an experienced economist economist, sorry, um, who's been leading a consortium tasked with creating a UK socio-economic scenarios, sometimes abbreviated to SSPs. Essentially, whilst we've been very, whilst we very much need to have a set of climate projections, we also need to have a set of projections that describe the various pathways, that describe the way in which the global economy and more local economy and society as well may evolve over the coming years. So I'll hand over to John, he'll provide a few more details. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm here to talk about the, the UK SSPs project today. This project ran from January 2020 to, to May 2021, so it was a, a bit less than 18 months. Um, as you can see, involved a wide range of, of stakeholders. Um, so um, we're Cambridge Econometrics for the lead, but we also um, had on board the UK CEH, uh, the University of Edinburgh and University of Exeter. Um, and as with all the other programmes being talked about today, this was funded under the UK Climate Resilience Programme, run through the Met Office. So um, I'll first talk about the motivations for the project. Um, so at a global level, as, as many of you will know, we have global um, shared socioeconomic pathways, uh, SSPs, and global uh, RCPs, so global um, concentration pathways for, for um, emissions. Um, and these are used to explore potential climate risks through essentially different combinations of the SSPs and the RCPs. Um, and at the UK level, we, we had UKCP18 climate projections, um, but we didn't have the equivalent UK level uh, SSPs. Um, there were some that were uh, based on basic projections. I think I'm allowed to say that because uh, I was the lead on that as well, um, that were included in the CCRA3. Um, but the aim was really to build on those and to develop a, a more coherent and consistent set of information for UK-based SSPs. Um, uh, and, and I want to stress really that uh, the, what, we what we produce in terms of outputs are very much an intermediate output. Right? The, these are um, uh, data series and, and information that is designed to be used by other researchers for other much more detailed research on climate risk and resilience. Um, so we see ourselves very much as a kind of an intermediary in this, in this process. And what were the outcomes for, from the project? Um, and you can see here, we've got four board categories. Um, and I think what, what this is, and, and I'll come to it on my, my last slide, which is about challenges. This, this shows sort of, if you like, the challenge of being able to meet the different needs of different users. So we had uh, very deliberately a very diverse set of outcomes that could be used by people who were looking for different levels of information, had different interests, had different focuses, things they wanted to understand from the UK SSP's database. So we started with uh, narratives for all five SSPs. 
Um, these were very qualitative. So, so this is, um, you know, um, each was about a 10 page uh, sort of report uh, storyline ultimately um, for the UK and the four nations. So to explore uh, you know, at that kind of level, the, the spatial differences uh, in the SSPs um, for three different time slices. So for 2040, 2070 and 2100. Understanding essentially uh, under each of these SSPs, what does the future look like? Um, what, what are people doing? What are businesses doing? Um, the, as I say, the kind of underlying storylines for each uh, for each of the SSPs. Uh, we also constructed uh, what we called a, a set of system diagrams, that, uh, and these were designed to um, go one step beyond those narratives to, to have a way of visualizing the interrelationships, the key the key relationships um, between what we call drivers. Um, uh, essentially what are the what, what are the key um uh the, the key linkages what what's driving what um uh you know to, to lead to the outcomes that we see in the ssps how are different groups interacting with one another um what what is the politics for example um and and how does that lead to different these different outcomes that we see uh, i've got an example of that on the next slide um and, and of course that, the key thing here is also how do they differ so, um, you know, it's, this is not the same set of drivers, the same set of relationships in each, but actually different drivers and, and different, uh, different linkages having different levels of importance across the different SSPs. And that's essentially what leads to the different outcomes that we see. We produced um, uh, a lot of what we call semi-quantitative trends. This is essentially a sort of a five point scale, uh, plus, 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 no change, uh, minus and minus, minus. Um, compared to a sort of the current situation um, over again, these three time slices of 2040, 2070, 2100, um, for, for a, a large range of socioeconomic indicators. Um, these uh, semi-quantitative trends were developed um, in stakeholder groups. We had a week long workshop in uh, May, 2020 uh, to, to go through these and basically agree um, in groups uh, what, what the, the the sort of the right trends for these uh, for these indicators were in each of the SSPs, um, and and really the the purpose of the semi quantitative trends is to allow us to cover a large range of, of of indicators, to give a sort of broad brush indication of of where we see a large number of different uh, variables going in the different SSPs. Um, and finally, we had the quantification of a, a much smaller subset of indicators. Um, so this was producing uh, detailed hard numbers essentially for these indicators um, to be fed into uh, into into different models um, that might use the database. Um, and I've got the the sort of the prov proviso here at the appropriate temporal and spatial resolution. We spent a lot of time and effort trying to work out what was appropriate for each of the different indicators that we produced. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, that that's about okay, just for the, the, the three time slices, 2040, 2070, 2100. Sometimes it was um, annual. Obviously, for a lot of these quantitative indicators, there is some degree of path dependency. Yeah, you know, so that actually the intermediate years matter. It's not just a question of three time slices. And also in terms of the the spatial um, resolution, um, some of these, you know, it's appropriate to do them at, at national level, some at regional level, and some at much more detail, for example, land use. But also thinking back to the overarching purpose of the SSPs, they aren't supposed to uh, reflect uh, the, the climate projections, right? They have to be re completely removed, at least as far as possible, removed from the climate projections so that the two can be overlaid. So we had to do these at an appropriate spatial resolution where we weren't, at least as far as possible, weren't making decisions that related to, to climate outcomes. Um, so, for example, you know, we didn't want to look at population trends at a kind of square kilometre level or, 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 or even more detailed, um, because at that level, you, you, know, you are having to reflect um, the changing climate. So, so I mentioned the um, sort of systems diagram. This is actually the front end to the model. So this is how you as users can interact with the outcomes of our project. Um, uh, it's built in a, in a tool called Insight Maker. Um, uh, and but this is essentially what the systems diagram sort of this is the interactive version uh, in the the outputs of the project there are sort of much smarter looking versions um, but actually this is a way of interacting with 
Um, each of the different topics you see here, um, if you, you can click on the, the little buttons, the little relation tags, and that it explains the linkages in this particular SSP. This is SSP1. Um, explains the dynamics that take place in SSP1 over time that link these different key drivers. Um, and the strengths of those linkages are reflected in the, the arrow. So the, the, the solid arrows are the, are the more important uh, linkages, whereas the dotted ones are, are less, less significant, at least in this particular SSP. Um, and you can see here uh, along the, the bottom left, links to all of the different projections, the user manual, all the outputs. And indeed, you can, you can click on each of the drivers here to also see the driver specific um, outputs from the project. Um, and, and we felt that, that having this kind of user-friendly front end was, was uh, very important, again, to make sure that our outputs were as accessible as possible to as wide a range of people as possible. Um, and people that wanted to understand the narratives needed to be able to, to look at this and understand it in the same way that people that actually want access to sort of the full tables of all quantified projections. Um, so that's why we, we, we put time and effort into building this kind of front end to allow people to, to interrogate it. Um, and if you want to see this, you want to see all the other outputs from the project, I should say, if you just Google UK SSPs, um, you should find that I think the first link is to the Cambridge Econometrics website, but the second link that comes up under Google is to the, uh, uh, to, is to the Climate Resilience Programme website, where we have all of these outputs stored, including access to these, these insight makers for each of the five SSPs. So I'd just like to, to, to finish by um, reflecting a bit on some of the key challenges that we faced. And actually some of these, I think I've said a little bit about um, as we've gone through. Um, one of the, the key challenges we had as a, as a consortium was about the internal consistency of these. So um, uh, the now, obviously, as I've shown, the, the narratives came first, then the semi quantitative trends, then the quantifications. Um, and, and on the first sort of drafting of all of these, we, we found, um, uh, things that were either counterintuitive or that, that kind of went against earlier findings. So when we did some of the quantifications and we applied sort of a rules-based system to a lot of those quantifications, we got outcomes that were, were different in some SSPs to the narratives. And then we had to think about and iterate the narratives and the quantitative trends to get some to a kind of final position we agreed on. We also um, uh, had challenges, I think, in understanding how some of the scenarios come to pass, and particularly uh, the uh, SSP5, the kind of fossil fuel-based growth scenario, thinking that through, thinking, well, how do we think um, that these different indicators are going to interact to develop some of those? So, so there were definitely some sort of um, uh, methodological or storyline challenges, as well as just in terms of developing that, that consistency. Um, we discovered the importance of ongoing communication with stakeholders. You know, we needed buy-in from this. We, we need stakeholders to want to use the data at the end of the project. Um, it's frankly been a, you know, a huge waste of our time if nobody's going to use the data and the information once it's produced. So um, we, we put a lot of time and effort into ongoing communication, made more difficult, of course, by COVID, um, in order to engage with stakeholders, to tell them when things were coming out, um, to, to ask them to review things, to get their views, and to try and take their views into account as we developed the outputs of the project. Um, and that was challenging because those stakeholders inevitably had a long and varied list of requirements. Um, and as I said earlier, that was a key reason for the, the sort of diverse list of, of outputs that we finally had from the project. And we tried to cover as much ground as we could in as much depth as we felt we were able to in, in, in the time available um, to try and provide something useful to a, a wide range of those stakeholders. Um, and as I've mentioned already, a key challenge on, on the quantifications was about identifying the appropriate temple and spatial resolution. Um, and, and inevitably, there are some people who are um, happy with what we've done and what we've provided, and some others that, that aren't, or at least you know want, want to and will have to do their own off uh, sort of off database work to produce things that are different uh, temporal or spatial resolution to allow them to use it for their own research. Um, but we were transparent in the whole process and kind of communicating that that would be the case. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there as I say, just, just, just to say, if anyone's interested in, in finding out more about the project and about the out, outcomes, if you just Google UK SSPs, you'll, uh, you'll find the relevant pages. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, and now we'll move on to our last presentation of this part of the session, which is about a um, project called OpenClim. 
This is designed to support UK assessment of climate risks and adaptation, uh, basically developed and applied in an integrated assessment model that includes both climate information and also the SSPs that we've just heard about. So the project is led by Professor Robert Nichols from the Tyndall Centre, but the project team draws upon experience from a wide range of other institutes. And we're very fortunate this morning to have Alistair Ford to speak with us and share some of their work to date. After this presentation, we'll go back through the questions that have been coming in. So please continue to uh, put forward the questions that you might have. Over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Mark. Uh, John, if you could just stop sharing because for some reason I am unable to, to share until, thank you, until you've uh, finished with your, thank you very much. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides now. So um, welcome to my holiday cottage in Norfolk where I'm uh, broadcasting from today. And I'd like to give you a, um, a quick run through of the Open Clim project. This is a project that similarly to the UK SSPs that John just described to us is funded by the UK Climate Resilience Programme. We're only halfway through our uh, short sprint to develop uh, a UK national climate change risk assessment framework. But I'd like to share with you what we're hoping to achieve. And I think it's a good opportunity also to get some feedback from, from those in the audience of this event today. Open Clim is um, a response to this climate resilience call and it's a 28 month project. So we've got a, an extra 10 months on, on John and his team to develop the next generation of national climate change risk assessment for the United Kingdom. And our vision is to improve on the um, capabilities in the, in the UK and improve on previous UK climate change risk assessment work through the development and implementation of a, of a framework. And I'll touch on this in a moment, but also build a community of practitioners and developers to make sure we have a long-term and sustainable um, framework that we, we can rely on for future CCRAs. And, and coming at this from, uh, I'm, I'm a lecturer in geospatial data analytics, and, and therefore I'm interested in, in geospatial data. And I would say that climate risk is an inherently geospatial problem because of the, the spatial intersection of, of many different components. Um, the key issues we're trying to tackle in, in the Open Clim project are um, really about linking existing models together. We're not attempting to develop necessarily new models in this Rather, rather, we're attempting to link together existing models of um, climate hazard and, and build a, a risk assessment framework that includes uh, socioeconomic factors like those described by John Stenning in the, in the previous talk. So we're building a model coupling, essentially, um, and, a, and a system that allows the representation of both the risk part of, of the, um, the climate risk assessment work, but also the adaptation part. Um, to explore what we might do about that risk as it increases in the future. And as I mentioned, we're trying to build a community model so that people who have alternative models of, say, flood risk or heat risk can slot those models into this open claim framework in the future um, and add to it and, and build it and grow it as, um, as knowledge grows. We're using the STFC's, uh, the um, Science and Technology Funding Council's Daphne platform, Data Analytics Facility for National Infrastructure, which is built on a, on a large kind of computing resource down at Harwell at the, um, uh, the laboratory there. And this is designed to give us a powerful framework for software integration and also a, le a legacy so that when the project finishes, the models still exist, which is something that's sometimes a problem in, in previous risk assessment approaches. We're building a national model, as I mentioned, which will work everywhere in the UK. Um, and there are some challenges in this um, with you know, different data, geospatial data providers in devolved administrations, for example, and different um, adaptation managers, for example. We're also using two focused case studies, however, to, to attempt to test our national framework in a more local setting. So we, we have a set of local stakeholders who understand their own context, and therefore we can test out our national inputs um, on people who understand the landscape. And stakeholder engagement is a strong component of the project. It has to be because we need to understand um, stakeholder needs and requirements for climate risk information. Um, and also we need to um, understand stakeholder data. So we know we need to know who's using what data, what data could be provided and what models are currently in existence too to build into this framework. 
The Open Clim project is made up of a, a number of members, um, including the, the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, of which I'm a member from Newcastle University uh, and also the University of East Anglia Tyndall Centre members are represented. We also have Bristol University, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, CEH, um, the STFC, as I mentioned, for the computing resource, and Paul Sayers, who's working on some of our flood risk um, analysis. This is um, quite an important kind of diagram that tries to explain how the open claim framework is structured. And, and if you think about this as a, a structure of two halves, on the left, we have the climate world. So we have climate scenarios provided by um, things like CMIP6 climate model outputs uh, or UKCP18 uh, scenarios at, at different spatial scales. And we run those climate scenarios through a set of um, models that represent the, the mediating physical processes that convert climate into hazard. Um, so things like flood models and hydrological models more generally, water resource models, et cetera. So that gives us the climate change side of the story that will play out in the UK in the future years. But on the right hand side, we also have the socioeconomic part of this the picture. And, and John gave us a nice uh, demonstration of the, the UK SSP component of this. But also we have other future scenarios that we might consider, like the ONS population scenarios, et cetera, which are possibly built into the UK SSPs as well. And this gives us the, the socioeconomic processes that will play out alongside the climate processes. So therefore we've got on the left, the hazard part of risk and on the right, the vulnerability and exposure part of risk playing out together. And these come together in a set of risk assessment models um, along the bottom here, which then allow us to test adaptations, adaptations which might um, reduce the, the hazard through changing those physical processes or might reduce the vulnerability and exposure through changing the, the socioeconomic processes. And eventually we come up with a set of, of adaptation options. Um, so what we're trying to deliver to the, the next CCRA and, and possibly the one after that is, is a set of consistent scenarios um, and outputs across all sectors. So individual sectors aren't doing their own thing. Um, an expansion of scope into this hazard vulnerability and exposure world. So we, we can think about consistent land use or land cover models into the future or urban development scenarios. And then an expansion of scope into more sectors than in previous CCRAs. We also want to look at a systematic analysis of the trade-offs and synergies between sectors, potentially looking at adaptation options which might address more than one hazard and understand how that plays out. Um, and also we want to see a wider use beyond just the CCRA and the national um, adaptation program into you know, other users who might be local authorities or water companies or um, other agencies, for example. And as I said, stakeholders are an important part of this. And from our stakeholder discussions, there's a, there's a lot of things that have come out here. But what I wanted to highlight here is that location is crucial in a lot of these points that our stakeholders have made. We want to understand where things are happening. We want to understand things like land use as an adaptation option and integrated spatial planning as an adaptation option. Uh, we want to inform decisions at a range of scales. And we want spatial data as an output not just um, you know, kind of summary spreadsheets, for example. So there's a lot of desire from our stakeholders for spatial data to be provided. John's covered the UK SSPs, but we'll be using these in open claim as the driver of that socioeconomic half of the, the risk assessment framework. And these will drive the vulnerability and exposure components, as I said, of the open claim assessment. Um, and we'll, we'll provide, um, We'll use the UK SSPs as inputs and, and provide spatial outputs of what these mean for um, things like land use change or under different adaptation scenarios. Um, so here's an example of how we might use the SSPs in, in Open Clim, and this is something we're working on at the moment, how we can use the future population scenarios through a set of planning assumptions to drive potential urbanization, and then plug that into an impact assessment model, in this case, surface water flooding. So you can see how urbanization might change the risk from climate change going into the future. We have biodiversity and land cover models in um, open claim, which are again spatial. So we have um, the, the CEH land cover data as a, as a baseline to this. And then we have a set of models that look at how under a changing climate, um, this biodiversity and land cover might change naturally 
And on top of that, we can superimpose the human um, dimension of this through land use planning and urbanization and try to see how we can control urbanization in a way that protects or enhances biodiversity under a changing climate. Uh, and this urban development is being simulated through a set of um, planning assumptions where we can start to look at different planning options to say, well, if we preclude development from the most flood prone areas, what does that do in terms of other risks that we might want to consider? And this is where the, the trade offs and co benefits might come in. But again, this is inherently sp spatial. We need to know where change might happen and therefore understand what that does to the risk uh, as a vulnerability and exposure component of this risk alongside the hazard components. And if we think about adaptation as a spatial process, um, we're thinking about um, how we might use two scales of adaptation here in, in land use planning, for example, global planning rules where you might say, let's preclude development from flood risk areas or preclude, preclude development from the most fertile farmland to protect future food provision. So that gives us the global picture of where things are built, but then we can also zoom into a local level and think, well, if we're now starting to allow development in a certain location, there are different ways we can provide development um, with additional green infrastructure, for example, for, for adaptation. So we're building these things into modeling workflows that look a bit like this with lots of complex modeling components, plugging things together. And again, this is where the spatial component is very important because a lot of these models are spatial. And that shared location is what allows us to drill down to that future risk from, from climate that includes hazard vulnerability and exposure components. Uh, now, hazards we're modeling include uh, flooding, drought and water supply, and, and heat stress, and each has its own spatial footprint. And here's some examples of those kinds of spatial models that we're including in OpenClim. And I just want to finish with um, what we're doing with, with the Daphne framework. Daphne is where we're providing the modeling capabilities and Daphne allows us to build these kinds of workflows where we can couple models together um, and set up the models through an interactive um, interface with spatial location, um, spatial resolution, etc. in here and model parameters and then include the, the various data sets that we want to use so we can specify the ordnance survey data sets we want to use, we can specify the UK CP scenario we might want to use, we can specify the UK SSP scenario we might want to use, and then we can run the model and produce, in this case, a map of buildings exposed to a certain flood depth. Okay, that's uh, just about me done. But in summary, we've, we've got a lot of geospatial data and we're building a, a data plan at the moment. Um, and geospatial data is one of the key issues with, uh, with a lot of this work at a national scale. So we need to work with stakeholders like the Ordnance Survey in, in Great Britain, but also OSNI in Northern Ireland to understand how we get access to the data that we require. So that's that's it for me. Thanks. And uh, I think now, Mark, back to you. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, yes, that's brilliant. So this concludes, or your presentation concludes the first um, half of this session. And there have been a few questions coming in. Uh, so thank you for um, sharing those with us. Uh, I'm just going to pick um, two or three, uh, if that's okay. Mindful of time, I don't want to uh, hand over to Sarah being somewhat late. Um, so Rachel, the first question is for you regarding the coastal work um, of which you spoke earlier. The question is, how is the Met Office collabor collaborating with local resilience forums and organisations for critical infrastructure, such as electricity networks or the water sector, or rail, for example. Could you respond to that, please? Yeah, great, thanks, Mark. Um, so this sort of hinges on the final slide that I had in my presentation around sort of future applications. Um, I should mention that a lot of the work I've done to date has all been to do with sort of the underpinning science and the capabilities that we have in this area. Um, so some early work that we've been doing is with the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, as I've mentioned. Um, so they're involved in sort of petrol processing and the oil and glass and nuclear, so all to do with sort of energy supply and how we can protect those sort of industries on the coast. 
And then we've also have some conversations with the Environment Agency um, and they own a lot of the coastal defences around the UK. And these are specifically to protect those critical infrastructures that you mentioned. So to do with road and rail or water treatment works um, and those kind of things. But specifically local resilience forums, we've not had any sort of communication or conversations with those yet. So if there's anybody on the call or listening in um, that's involved in any of those and does want to sort of focus on this a bit more going forwards, then I'd be more than happy to have any conversations with those people um, that think this would be useful. And sort of the stakeholder and the user engagement is the next section of this work. So we've done sort of a lot of the science and now we're looking at translating that into something useful for the different communities. So yeah, please do get in contact with me. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next question is for Andrew. Um, so the question is, what about the health impacts from new issues such as increased population or say malaria mosquitoes in warmer and wetter environments that might result from changes to weather patterns? Yeah, I think that's that's a great um, a great question, and obviously that's not something I've done any work on, but there is there is work in the literature around that. I think um, there are also questions just around um, not necessarily novel diseases, but the spread of existing diseases. So the the spread of influenza, for example, and how that might change under under certain weather conditions. And again, there's been lots of really interesting work on that. So um, that that there's a really open field there which which would be would be interesting to explore with 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 time and uh, and resource thank you andrew maybe the final question for you um alistair um about again about stakeholders so um for the open clin open clin stakeholder group uh, are the, is there representation from the distribution network operators or anyone from the energy um, or electricity, electricity industry? Yeah, good question. Thanks for that. Um, uh, not directly um, from, from the top of my head, but I think that the infrastructure providers generally are a key stakeholder um, that we'd like to, to develop stronger links with. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the development of the models from OpenClaim came from the ITRC consortium, which was the infrastructure transitions research consortium. So there is a strong infrastructure interest in open claim, but we've focused more on the kind of natural processes um, that, that drive climate risk and the, and the more global processes like land use change, etc. Uh, but I think clearly there is a, an importance to understand the, the impact of any climate uh, hazards, etc. on infrastructure and electricity infrastructure is clearly important. So, so please do get in touch um, if you'd like to, to have a conversation about getting the electricity distribution uh, operators onto, onto the Open Clim Consortium Stakeholder Group. Super, thank you for, for confirming, Alistair. I'm just conscious that uh, we've had a number of questions um, from people that are listening live. Um, there will be others who listen in slower time using the on-demand um, facility. So. For that community who are watching uh, at a later date, if there are any questions that you might have or an offer of getting involved with some of the project work or acting from a user perspective, please reach out to um, any of us on this call, either through email or through LinkedIn or whatever other way um, makes most sense. Um, so now we have a short talk by Sarah Lindley, which was very much intended to be a bit of a bridge between the two sessions. And um, this has been pre-recorded. So, Anita, would you be able to play this, please? And once this is concluded, we'll move on to Sarah's session, uh, which is going to be a bit more interactive. Um, and I think you're using Menti, um, but video and then Menti. Thanks, Anita. So the first half of this session has considered what data are being produced through programmes like the UK Climate Resilience Programme. However, data provision is only one part of the story, of course. We also need to think about data use. 
In my presentation, I'm going to take us from data provision to this idea of using data. For this, I'm going to draw on, on our experiences from using the UK-based Climate Just project and um, subsequent analyses of how um, data have been used in practice. So what is Climate Just? Well, Climate Just is a free web tool for public service providers, and it's designed to identify who is vulnerable to climate change and why. And that's done with a particular emphasis on flooding and heat related events. It's designed to highlight neighbourhoods where climate disadvantage is highest. And it's designed to help with decision making about what actions um, can be taken in, in response. So it was initially launched in February 2015. And we're currently updating some of the data now with funding from Friends of the Earth for England and Climate Exchange for Scotland. Geospatial data is at the core of the site. The site's map tool allows composite maps and underlying factors, for instance, about sensitivity and adaptive capacity to be investigated interactively. And that includes how they combine with data about information about the likelihood and severity of events themselves. Now, the tool allows people to look across areas or deep dive into particular areas of interest to get a profile of what's, what drives vulnerability and disadvantage at those locations. And from there, you can investigate what actions can be taken to build resilience. So whether you find out a local area um, needs to adapt buildings or it needs to stimulate social responses through community engagement, the site will um, give you, if you like, a set a menu, a set of ideas about what to do next. So who's been using the tool and, and, and how? Well, we've only actually had a registration system since summer 2018. But um, even that limited snapshot of data suggests that there's a wide range of users and, and quite a, a large number of users and many more really um, that, than we anticipated at the start of the actual project. So um, we had around 1,432 users um, and our top user group was local government. So um, around 370 uh, local government um, uh, registered users for context there are around 400 principal local authorities in the UK as a whole. But look at the second one, students and school pupils um, really um, pleased that uh, the you know, younger people were looking at this and, and curious to find out more about um, some of the issues too. We had um, users from consultancy, research organisations, NGOs, um, health organisations as, as well. It, it, and in the other group, there's a, you know, a, a big, really big range of, of different users, far too many for me to summarise right now. So our analyses of uses revealed a range of ways that the resources were actually being used in practice. So a big chunk of, of what people started to use resources for was to raise awareness and also engage people. This helped to bring new perspectives into existing areas of activity. So, for example, social dimensions into decision making. And it also stimulated others to think about what might be missing in risk assessments and decision make making. And we saw that being also influencing thinking um, internationally as well. But I've got just a couple of very short examples for, from England um, to give you a bit of a flavour. So Hull City Council have been a long running user of the resources um, and they cited benefits so, so, uh, associated with supporting partnership working um, and identifying responses that might have multiple benefits. So they talked about um, being able to get people around the table to look at maps and to discuss the content of those maps. Um, being part of a way of starting conversations and bringing people in from sectors who don't traditionally consider them, themselves uh, a, you know, a, a part of uh, who needs to respond to climate change. And some specific um, uses were that they used uh, the resources to ensure that developers for a new extra care facility, so this is for um, uh, social care, 
uh, were considering vulnerabilities and also ways that this uh, new facility might be of wider benefit to the uh, community during extreme events as well. Staffordshire County Council combined climate just data with their own data holdings and they saw a gap in their original flood risk assessment because of not considering social dimensions. And this is something that we've seen replicated across many examples, including internationally. So what sort of lessons have been learned? Data resources are ever growing and a range of data is important to bring in. So um, the data resources are even larger in that respect. And the use of geospatial data, of course, has its challenges as well. So there's currency as associated with any data sets and also scale. And not all factors lend themselves to data and maps, and we shouldn't pretend that they do. Nevertheless, geospatial data has a really important role to play, and there is much more that we can do to turn data into usable information and, and to make it as, as useful as possible in decision making. So my last slide um, is just to make you aware of a new investment by uh, UK Research and Innovation into digital solutions. It was an, actually announced on Saturday as part of uh, COP um, and it's a four year £7 million programme aiming to improve access to a range of environmental data and help UK organisations respond to climate change and improve um, public health. So the main foci are climate ready nation and connected health nation. And the initiative is about harvesting the many data resources which already exist and developing a range of digital solutions, whether that's analytics, tools, translations, which allow data be, to be used more effectively for decision making. So we're looking for people to get involved. If you're interested, please contact Richard Kingston. You can see his um, uh, email on, on the slide there, but if in any doubt, just please just co contact me um, through one of the pavilion me mechanisms. Um, and of course, we'll be listening very carefully to the discussions in the remainder of this session too. So before we get into the discussion proper and I hand back over to Alistair, uh, Mark Alistair and I wanted to get a feeling about who you are in the audience and about what some of your initial impressions are about using geospatial data. So while I sort out getting the interactive part of the presentation up and running, um, here's a QR code for accessing uh, the questions, or you can just go to menti.com using the, the code above. OK, um, just give me a moment and I will be moving on to the interactive element. Hello everyone, this is me live now and um, you've been very patient listening to a uh, lot of presentations um, and so now we did want to move to um, ask you some questions and to start this kind of uh, more getting into more of a debate. So as context then for that, um, could I ask you to specify which country you're from? So uh, we'd like to get a handle on whether you're um, from a devolved nation within the UK or whether you're listening in um, from other parts of the world uh, to the session today. Um, so this will help us just to um, make sure that we're tailoring some of the um, aspects of, of our um, panel discussion to give a little bit more um, specificity really and, and hopefully relevance to, to um, where you're from and, and where you, you know what kind of uh, questions you might have so oh it's good to see with there's some coming through now um that does show we've got a really good uh, global reach actually from indonesia um, and germany uh, as well as uh, from the uk nations so thank you for those of you um who are pop popping in your information and um, if you've not had a chance to um find the mentee so far, you can open it in a browser or you can do it on a mobile phone. Um, it's all very um, easy to do there. So uh, the code is 84328824. So that's the number that you type in. All right, so um, we'll move on um, from this in the interest of time. 
So don't worry, you've got plenty of time to put in interactive elements as well. So can we move on? So how would you characterize your own area of work then? Do you consider yourself a data creator? We've heard from a lot of data creators already, or are you more on the user side? Is it difficult to, to give one or the other of those? Um, or, or are you working in an area that's, a, that's entirely uh, different, but not, not specifically related to data at all? So can you please um, give us your views on, um, on that? Are you a data creator, data user? Maybe, maybe a lot, number of us are, are both. Or are we undecided? Can't decide at all on this particular slide. So, okay, so I shall move on from here. And these, those will probably pop up for um, the final, uh, if you're listening kind of on demand later, um, if there's been a delay with these coming through, we will um, find, you know, that the slide will be updated for you later on. Okay, so what is your organisation type? Maybe this one is, is, is slightly more, slightly easier for us to make a decision about. So we have a few academics in here, someone from private sector, central government, an NGO as well. And so academic, well, obviously we, we know we've got, we've got the speakers from the academic world as well, but it'd be oh, interesting to find out who the other is in here. So just a, um, well, get an interested member of uh, the public, which is obviously great as well. Important users actually of, of, of climate data. Okay, so this gives us a, we've got a good um, breadth of, of people here. Thank you very much for um, answering that slide. And what does best describes your sector? So this is about typing in your kind of sector. Is it, is it um, electricity? Is it uh, transport? Um, are you joining from, you know, uh, planning maybe? Um, or are you into are you research? focused again this will just give us a flavor of, of who's out there and who's who's listening um in order to understand what um kind of questions we might be getting into uh, later on ah so we've got um multi-sector um audience which is which is good ah security that's one i hadn't actually thought of so interesting um to get that view and inclusivity as well okay well we could keep this running for quite a while but in the interest of time i'm going to move on but thank you for putting those um uh um Coding. Oh, and actually now geospatial has, has le leapt out as the as the top category, which oh, it's just been usurped. But um, but yes, geospatial energy and research, um, some of the key areas then for our audience. And I'm now going to move on to the last interactive slide, and this very much takes us from um, the you know listening part to thinking about the discussion part so for you then what are the biggest challenges of using geospatial data for assessing climate resilience so there's some um different themes in here is it about the avail availability of data is that the biggest challenge or do you think there's lots of data out there already but the challenge is actually using it what about the relevance of the data? Is that the thing that's that's um, holding you back? Um, or is it more about integrating different data sets um, together? We've heard a little bit about uncertainty. Um, and we is, is that one of the, the challenges? 
or is it more to do with um you know how actual data is is, is accessible so maybe that's comes at a cost or is it's licensed or so on so the idea here is just to give us a bit of an idea of um your initial perspectives and um, I hope this is also giving you some food for thought for the interactive sessions later on as well for the panel. So at this point, um, Alistair, I will turn out, I will give the floor back to you to take over from here to lead into the panel session. Thank you, Sarah. And that's a, a nice insight into both who we've got in the in the room today, but also some of the challenges that I think people are facing. And, and it's nice to see that you know, see, there's a, a variety of challenges and a, and a variety of different backgrounds and sectors represented today. So for the rest of the time we have available, and thanks Sarah for setting up the Menti actually, I think that was a really nice thing to have, uh, just to help us understand who we are and what we're, what we're dealing with. So the rest of the time we have today, so for the next kind of 35 minutes or so, we'd like to have a, an open panel discussion. So two of our speakers from this morning, uh, from the earlier session, Andrew and Rachel, will be uh, joining the panel, but we have two new panel members who you've not met yet. So I'd like to give those two panel members the opportunity to introduce themselves and to uh, share a little bit about their background and their work. So first up, I'd like to invite Susanna Can -can -pa -pa? I don't know whether I've said that right, um, but Susanna can introduce herself and, and say her name far more eloquently in her own language. Um, Susanna is from the, the city of Helsinki in, in Finland and is an environmental planner with a, a huge with breadth of experience in, in land use planning, environmental planning and adaptation. So Susanna, please introduce yourself and the work that you do um, and, and then I'll take back over when you're finished. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alistair. Uh, as it always happens with this, uh, my dog has been silent for an hour and a half and now he started barking. But anyway, I, I hope he, he stops. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I do work uh, in the city of Helsinki and, and I work mainly in, in coordinating and a strategic level uh, planning of adaptation. And from the Sarah Menti, I would say that I'm a data user. I work in local government and my area of work is adaptate, adaptation, all sectors, all urban sectors. So, and in the next slide, um, uh, just shortly about Helsinki. Uh, I, maybe you're all familiar with it, but it's, it's a city of about uh, 640,000 people and it's a fast growing city and it is also a coastal city and in the next slide uh, I have some uh, examples of uh, this um, geo uh, geospatial data we have in in the city and what we are using in adapt also in adaptation planning uh, in in Helsinki uh, and, and in the Helsinki metropolitan area social uh, vulnerability mapping um, has been carried out in in 2015 it was based on the climate just framework uh, but uh, unfortunately it has not really been used in the city planning uh, so far and why is that uh, we we have a, a maybe a, a strange problem but we have two good data so we have faced many of the data security issues here uh, and and uh, and and also so 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 far uh, it's it's not been used but we have a champs pro project it's a finished uh, uh, Academy of Finland funded project starting where we're going to uh, uh, bear, uh, well tackle these challenges and also uh, update the mapping and then uh, include some new indicators to it. Uh, well, in addition, we have uh, green areas and green network uh, uh, data. And then we we'll have also accessibility, for example, accessibility to green areas data. Uh, we have urban trees uh, 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 data and it's an open data. So also the citizens can go and check the trees, but it's also important for, for example, urban planners 
and 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 people working in the environmental sector and public area sector to see where the trees are so they can be for example protected when uh, new construction is coming then we have land covered data uh, which is used pretty much in all, all all green areas and public spaces planning, for example, and it also includes the impervious area areas, which is good for adaptation planning. A new uh, tool that we are developing now is a green regional green factor tool. Uh, this is based on uh, on a um, tool uh, uh, developed in Sweden. It has different layers. Uh, it has the green area, but it has layers, uh, for example, uh, noise and biodiversity, uh, stormwater management, and so on. So it's it's um, it brings uh, into the urban planning analysis more aspects or ecosystem services than just the green area amount. And uh, the carbon sinks have been mapped in the Helsinki metropolitan area. The last one is, is just a uh, link to a seminar that we uh, happen to have have, uh, have in, in September about the uh, geospatial data in the Helsinki metropolitan area and how it has been used in adaptation planning. But this is unfortunately only in Finnish. So that was my presentation. Thank you. And thank you, Susanna. That's a, a really nice summary of some of the the work that's been going on in, in Helsinki on, um, on adaptation and the role of geospatial data in that. Yeah. Um, our other panelist for the second session is Jade Berman from uh, Climate Northern Ireland. Uh, Jade, are you able to share your slides while I introduce you? Um, Climate Northern Ireland is a, is a network devoted to the bringing together um, or increasing an understanding of, of climate change impacts and risks in Northern Ireland. And Jade is the acting manager there at the moment. But Jade, I'll allow you to introduce yourself and give a little bit more background to, to Climate Northern Ireland and the TALCS project. So over to you if you're happy to present. Thank you. Thank you there, Alistair. So um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the TALCS project. But I'll just give you, I'm glad that he just gave that wee introduction about Climate Northern Ireland. We're a, like I said, we're a network, so um, we do bring together people from the public sector, both national and local government, also the private sector, in terms of in particular umbrella organisations, and also the civil sector as well, so NGO umbrella organisations as well, to kind of share within Northern Ireland best practice, and also to commission work as well, to try and fill a lot of the many gaps that we have over here. And part of that is a project called TALEX, which is Transboundary Adaptation Learning Exchange. This project is um, the, the lead partner is based at UCC, which is University College Cork Town in Ireland at the Marae Centre, but we're also working in conjunction with SNIFA. It's funded by the Irish Environmental Protection Agency, and then we're the Northern Ireland partner and we're sort of based within Northern Ireland Environment Link. So why is this relevant to geospatial data? Well, what we're doing is we're developing a transboundary, innovative, collaborative learning network. And we're looking at this best practice in terms of structures and processes, which empower national, sectoral and local decision makers. We can't do this on our own, so we need to bring together lots of the best people from across the five jurisdictions to um, look to see, A, where we're at at the moment, so what's the national policy position and understand that baseline, B, what works well, what are the capacities that we might need to progress forward, and we're learning from other examples from elsewhere, and we've been running a range of workshops on some of these capacities. These include leadership, partnership, evidence, and um, we're about to run a, a workshop on resources soon as well. And so I'm going to just provide a couple of the key little bits of learning from the evidence workshop in terms of how that applies to not just taking the evidence as data, but translating that into knowledge that will be used. So. So the idea of this is that um, we're looking at sort of how, what are the capacities that you need to take um, data and, and turn it into knowledge? And what do you need at that beginning of that adaptation journey of a place? And what are the stages you need towards a resilient, well-adapted place? Because once you're you know, on that journey, it never stops. You keep having to do maintenance, of course. 
So we um, worked with lots of different practitioners uh, a couple of months ago in a workshop and they came up with some of these ideas about what was essential. So what everybody should be thinking about when they're thinking about place-based adaptation. So some of them are quite sort of, um, would be sort of typical, you think of them straight away. And some of the examples have come up already, which is good to see, sort of listening to the talks that have come before me. But things like mapping of evidence, of course, but it's actually knowing how often this is collected, how it's analysed, level of detail, the quality of that data, accessibility. So this is something I'd sort of emphasise here is who is going to use that data and who are they going to show it to? So it's not just the person who has to understand it, it's also that translation process to make it usable. Um, sort of at the beginning of that adaptation journey, there are examples such as adaptive windows, which is where you need those quick wins in relation to you know, there's funding available to get some evidence to show that this is something we should do. So it's often that kind of more ad hoc stuff before you can progress on to actually doing more strategic work to make sure that all those gaps are filled and that you actually are doing what needs to be done. And where you start to build in the monitoring and evaluation, so that feeds into your spatial data, it actually keeps correcting and ideally is updated very regularly so you're not working with out of date data and out of date evidence and you can see that clearly. Of course, this evidence comes in lots of forms. So you've got the sort of more scientific evidence, but you also have that local knowledge and perception. So you need to understand how will that evidence be interpreted and that social behavioral data is just as important in terms of making sure it's useful. Um, you need that sort of shift. Ideally, of course, we'd all love long-term funding and resources, which should keep things going and make things working. And it's also just constantly updating. So one of the things for Northern Ireland is quite often it gets missed off in terms of you know, data programs and evidence gathering. So we've got a gap, so then the decision makers can't make that evidence based on UK data because UK data doesn't actually cover Northern Ireland. So it's an example of where that specific spatial and temporal data is really important. And um, I'm glad it's come up in previous presentations as well. So it's, yeah, it's taking it and making sure that it's accessible and it's live across a cross-sectoral database. So I just wanted to say, if you want to get in touch with me either about Climate Northern Ireland or about the Talix project, so I can put you in touch with them. We've got another workshop running, which is on resources that you need for place-based adaptation on the 18th of November. Now, there is only about five people from each of the jurisdictions. So it's not like an open free-for-all. We try and sort of bring practitioners together, but we're always looking for more people who may have um, good stories and learning to contribute. So get in touch if you want to know. Thank you. Thanks, Jade, and thanks for the invitation to everyone out there. <laughs> so we'll now um, have, a, have an open discussion, really. So members of the audience, if you're listening in on the platform, please um, feel free to send your questions through for our, for our panelists um, so we can um, point them into, in the right direction. So we've got um, Susanna and Jade, who thankfully just introduced themselves, and Andrew and Rachel, if, if you'd like to, to switch your cameras back on too so we can um, have the full panel. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll take some of the, the audience questions and then I've got a few of my own questions if I can be indulgent as, to do that. Um, Andrew, I, I guess just to bring you back in, since you haven't spoken for a little while, um, I think there's there's possibly we saw in, in some of the mentee questions and also in some of the presentations that there can, tends to be quite a strong focus on the physical environment when we're talking about climate risk. But I think your presentation brought out the importance of the social aspect of this and, and, the, and considering people in this. Do we do you think we've focused too much on data about hazards and, and physical impacts of climate change and not enough on the social data? Um, I, I, so as, as a physical scientist, I think yeah, probably we, we do very much. I think um, one of the challenges coming to this problem as a physical scientist is I think that that data is often a lot easier to, to get a handle on and, and to use because it doesn't come with any kind of privacy or, um, you know, complications of, of, of that kind. Um, once data starts to involve people and communities then then it's it's much more difficult and and there are um inherent and important controls on how that data is used and so i think um trying to, to get over some of those barriers is is really important but yeah I, I absolutely agree with 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 what you said yeah thank you and susanna in your presentation you you talked a lot about um the, the kind of data that 
um, the, the city of Helsinki has available. Do, do you think the, the step from risk assessment to actual adaptation planning brings new or different requirements for geospatial data? Is there something more that we need when we're actually trying to adapt to these risks rather than just understand the, the scale or the location of them? Mm. Uh, yes, um, at least we we faced some um, additional <laughs> tasks that uh, that we've been thinking of. One of them is monitoring. Uh, we we would need to uh, show the change that is happening on the ground, and and how to do that. Uh, we we've been thinking of using the land cover data for that as one indicator. We all know that the indicators for adaptation are very difficult. <laughs> to make but then um, uh, then we would really uh, we we still don't have data enough to show see that change another thing is uh, what we you were just talking about the social aspects and our vulnerability mapping uh, like we we really faced the problems of do too good data we could uh, we we can map uh, um, our uh, city population uh, with the block, with the building, even even with the flat, but but naturally we can't use that type of data. <clears throat> so um, so we we would really um, scale that out somehow. Um, and then there's uh, the awareness ra raising part of it, bo both for our decision makers and and for the uh, for our uh, citizens. And how to visualize uh, both what we've been doing and what we have already, uh, what kind of adaptation actions have been carried out. People are more and more interested about that, but also the impact, uh, what kinds, kinds of impacts are, there are. My cats and dogs are getting really, really interested about this session. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. I don't think we can hear them, so I think you're okay, Susan. Don't worry. Yeah, I tried to keep my cat out, but but she's really eager to take part. But yeah, at least uh, those. But there are still. Oh yeah, then one uh, one other thing is is scenarios and and future plans. For example, we have this problem now that we are we are thinking of uh, because trees grow a long time in Finland. We we're in, we're a northern city. So we should plant the trees now that uh, are going to um, uh, provide cover and cooling in the future city. But where to do that? So we would we would need to add at the plants and the scenarios and and you know and the places where the where the uh, trees could be planted. Uh, yeah, here's our new member of the panel. <laughs> so yeah, okay, yeah, that's. Thanks. Thanks, Susanna. It's a good thing about being on a holiday at the moment. My cats are at home, so I don't have to worry about them inter interrupting. Um, Rachel, if I could bring you in. Uh, Susanna mentioned very, very local scale data there, you know, individual level data in, in individuals' apartments, etc. But you're obviously working more with a, a global scale problem. Um, what, what are the challenges of going from that global modeling scale down to local scale impacts. Do, do you have any insights on, on what we need to think about making that journey from global to local? Yeah, definitely. So to look at sort of the impacts for a single building or a single sort of property on the coast, there's a variety of different things that um, somebody would need to do. And it tends to involve a whole host of different sort of um, models and also people to run those models. So at the Met Office, we're sort of focused on the sea level projections sort of at a global or a regional scale. Um, and we will then provide those sea level projections They're on the UK CP18 marine interface, um, if anybody wants to sign up and, and download them. And then they tend to get sort of pushed into or used as boundary conditions to sort of more local scale models. Um, and these might be run by consultancies or the environment agency, um, and what they tend to do then is translate that global model, they'll downscale it, there's a technical term there, to link it to the edge of a domain um, along the coast. 
And then the final sort of step in looking at the impacts for that single building is to run what's called a flood inundation model. So it's taking a sea level projection from the, the large scale, the 50 kilometer resolution, translating that down into sort of more regional projections for sort of coastal impacts that's sort of more like seven kilometers, and then down again even further into sort of your coastal flood models, which can be as sort of precise as a, a two meter resolution if need be. Um, and then you're going sort of from Met Office data to sort of environment agency or sort of local data and in, into that consultancy space. Thanks, Rachel. It's very, very clear. Um, hopefully clear to our uh, audience too. And, and Jade, finally, to come back to you, the, the mentee showed us that people face a, a variety of challenges when using this kind of geospatial information on climate risk and, um, and adaptation. So. You had on your slide that the data needs to be at the right spatial scale. Do you have any feeling from the conversations you've had with, with your network and your kind of stakeholders that what that right scale might be for making the, the decision making we, we need to do? Well, most of them want it as local as possible. So, yeah, <laughs> literally, if you could have it down to flat level, that would be lovely. Um, I'm not normally demanding quite that much, but um, I think it's that kind of if we've got we work with a lot of councils for example and they want that data there for their area and they want the specifics there so it's kind of that getting that data it's often done at a uk level or a global level or whatever and actually translating that down not just the actual data so we have the data there but then the important thing for the user is it being in a form that they can understand because a lot of people don't really understand the climate change models they just want to know what does that mean to me and what do i need to say to our decision makers to get them to do the action, whatever it might be, to reduce that risk. So it's that kind of one is the scalability and two is that translation. And that isn't just in words and avoiding acronyms. That's also the lovely sort of beauty of spatial data is that visibility. So it's making it in a way that people can see because a picture tells a thousand words. And that makes a big difference if you've only got a one page brief to give to a minister on why they should act or do something. Yeah, thanks, Jason tricky things to think about. So uh, we've got a, quite a few questions coming in from the audience. So I'd just like to, to throw these open to the panel. So whoever feels like they're willing to answer would be, you know, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump in. If nobody puts their hands up, then I might have to point at you and, uh, and ask you to answer. Um, so there's a question here um, that asks about how can we get confidence that the data we're looking at is accurate? At a, at a given point in time. So um, it's important to know that, you know, the data is, is up to date and, and, and accurate. I guess there's a uncertainty enough in, in climate work without the, the kind of data question. And I would open that up to, I guess, metadata more generally. So is there enough good metadata about the data we're using that allows us to understand how good our decisions based on this, on these data are? Or, or is that still a challenge that we face? Does anyone have a, any thoughts on accuracy of data or, or metadata? That's, Susanna, what's, what, what's the situation in, in Finland? Do you, do you have you know, good metadata standards there that allow us to, to understand how good data is for our decision-making purposes? Um, well, um difficult question for a data use, user as, as well we we do get the data from our research institutes uh, um, and I, I i feel that we have very good uh, uh, data for um, what it concerns about climate change impacts and and scenarios and so on uh, so uh, and then there's uh, some of the spatial data yeah um, the city provides some of it, it itself, so uh, I guess there's the quality check is, and and then all our um, regional, um, um, well, like Helsinki region uh, environmental services provides the land cover data. So um, yes, I, I guess we we trust their quality, and and it's it's also easy for the well, it's it's possible for the city to check out. It's uh, itself with our experts' qualities, but then, uh, then uh, well, 
more specific <laughs> answers, maybe the researchers uh, could provide those. Yeah, I guess it shows the importance of a, of a strong relationship between uh, data users and data providers. Sarah, yeah, did you I, want to say something? Yes, I, I, Alistair, I, I, I had a kind of um, point on this as well. I really like this idea of having the timestamp uh, on the data sets, you know, re, I mean, as a sort of geospatial researcher, you know, we I, I do do that, but um, in with my own work and, and try and make that clear. But I, I think generally we could probably do that more and a, and a bit clearer. So, for example, uh, in some of the update work for Climate Just, we've been looking at using some of the um, multiple deprivation indicators, which have been updated in, in England, for example, for 2019. But if you even delve underneath into the detail of that, you'll find that some of those indicators are, are actually from 2016 and so on. So I think it's really important that we do that, um, you know, transparency with the data set. So I think that was, I just wanted to uh, kind of put, uh, you know, highlight that really, because I thought that was a, a great suggestion, actually. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, agreed. You know, we, I think, you know, as data providers, you know, th those of us who generate complex data sets, I think there's a responsibility on us to make sure that we get that, that metadata right and allow those people who use the data to understand what it is they're looking at, what the, what the relevancy and the, um, how up to date that data is. I, I guess there's a linked question here as well from the audience about, I'm not sure which of the talks this question was about, but I think I can, we can open this much more broadly that most of the talks are from a developed country context where we have too much data and, and as Susanna says, the data is too good, <laughs> which is a nice challenge to have. But how, do, how applicable are these discussions and these kinds of models to maybe the global south or developing nation context where there isn't such a richness of, of data availability or data quality? Does that present different challenges or maybe do we not have it quite so good in, in the developed countries even? Does anybody have any experience of, of working in other areas where data is, is not too good, but perhaps too bad or not enough? I, I don't have direct experience of that, Alistair, but there are plenty of people in, in Reading who, who do. I think, um, you know, that there are various, I think that is a challenge, but there are various ways of tackling that with uh, particularly for the physical climate drivers, I think reanalysis data is is now actually of quite good quality um, in many places and, and and can be used. And obviously, there are there are lots of kind of interesting bits of work being done around making use of of satellite data and 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 using satellite data as inputs to to provide more physical um, climate indicators where where no in situ measurements are are available. And so I think there's that there's good possibility of, of using some of that data um, in combination with with some of the projection data and, and even um, you know making use of of shorter range forecasts like seasonal forecasts and and sub seasonal forecasts to kind of build the the database of, of climate variability that that might be experienced in certain regions. Thanks, Andrew. Sarah, did you? something you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I just noted um, the question from uh, Richard Helen, actually, which is really relevant in this context about, you know, this um, school, he mentions uh, school and further education colleges getting involved in data collection and collation. And, and this sort of citizen science approach is, is one of the ways, isn't it, where we can um, bring in more data. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's, not going to cover all of the areas we've been talking about but it it does provide um a means of gathering data about you know events and impacts and vulnerabilities and so on yeah jade did you want to come in on that as well yeah just to, um, just to build on that on the importance of um you can call it citizen science but basically you've got your models but then you need to ground truth them so one of the things of one of the partners we're working in they were they have a wire app in the south of Ireland and basically public um, authorities all have this app on their phone 
uh, where they're testing at the moment and they basically you know put what's actually happening so you actually get that ground truth thing and there's no reason why that can't apply to others as well I know in previous projects I've worked on for has to do with water quality but basically the, the weather stations have gone and been put in schools so that they've got them there it's a safe place to put them where they're not going to get vandalized but then also the schools are involved in tracking that data and they get to feed real data back in and understand it lifetime so there's there's quite a lot of different ways that schools and the public and others can be involved in a quality as well as a quantitative way Um, Andrew, did you want to add something further? Yeah, I mean, just building building on what Jade said there. So um, um, some of you may have seen that, at least in England, the Department for Education launched a, a major new climate education strategy on Friday. Um, and, and we're actually launching our own part of that today at Reading. Um, but, but one part of that is a, is a new um, National Climate Leaders Award. And so we're, we're you know, students in schools will be encouraged to participate in um, local climate initiatives and, and exactly what um, Jade and, and Sarah were talking about there is, is, is imagined as part of that space. So I think it's actually a really exciting time to, to kind of be engaging schools and the local community in, in these kinds of issues. Yes, that I mean, this is this fascinating about the, you know, the, the range of different ways to get community involvement in, in this work. And there's a, there's a question coming late, late from someone who's arrived late and apologizes for that, that's fine. But um, the, about the role of, of local floodplains in, in flood risk prevention. But I think we could broaden that out about the role of kind of community knowledge. And, and you might say indigenous knowledge in some parts of the world, but we could use that same term here. So do, do you think we use enough local knowledge in our decision making and, and how might we use these kinds of geospatial or remote sensing perhaps techniques to, to gather that local knowledge to make sure we're building it into the uh, risk and resilience decision making work. Does any, I don't know whether Rachel, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you have any uh, experience of that in, in flood management in particular or coastal management? Yeah, yeah, I can come in on this one. And um, my case study that I would sort of talk about well, it sort of links back to the previous question around sort of uncertainty and in, in the geospatial data as well. Um, so a colleague of mine, he's in the international team, I'm in the UK team, um, and tide gauges in the UK are, are pretty good, um, I have to say. So for my work, they are really helpful in validating the climate models. But further afield, um, they're really quite sparse in nature, so they're quite difficult to get any data that you need to validate your sort of projections. Um, and even if there is one, the data itself might not um, exist to the same sort of grade that we need. Um, so thinking about sort of areas sort of in, in Asia, the, those tide gauge networks just aren't there to sort of validate um, the sea level projections that come out of the models. So one of the things that the team does is they work with sort of communities on the ground and they say, okay, if this is sort of the, the projection, this is what we think the risk would be now, is this appropriate based on what you know about flooding in your community? And if that all matches up, then they're quite confident to use those sea level projections. But if it doesn't match up, then there's some fine tuning that needs to be done on the scientists end to make sure that sort of the data that we're providing is appropriate for use in, in those communities. So that sort of links the community aspect with that sort of data spatial aspect there. That's great, thanks Rachel. Jade, did you want to add anything from your perspective? Yeah, I was just gonna add in because the Tides pro project is bringing together lots of examples from all over. So there are not as many community examples of like taking action in terms of the adaptation context but the Maharis community down um, just in Ireland there they're actually one of the groups which are bottom-up led in terms of both gathering the data getting the actions to happen and also then engaging authorities and others to collect the sort of data that way around so it's almost been done in the reverse and they've been quite successful I mean their issue is to do with um, coastal erosion so they're out on the spit there's a community at the end they're losing the road that kind of thing and the way that they formed, so it's almost looking from a bottom-up approach, 
and um, this is where sort of some adaptation work is shifting to actually have that local adaptation lead similar to what happens more internationally to have that acting as a bottom-up drive to then commission okay what data is it that you need and find it because if the data isn't there already somebody has to ask for it find a reason justify it and it's actually coming from the people of that community upwards and it's been quite a successful example both of resourcing getting stuff done and actually working so yeah that's an example of that that happening thanks that's a lo lovely example jade and uh yeah i mean it shows it shows the importance of involving uh the community stakeholders in all of this work doesn't it um there's a question um i think it came up in sarah's talk actually about the importance of geospatial data as a as an awareness raising in a communication tool as well so I don't know, Susanna, do you have any experience from Helsinki of, of how you can, we can use geospatial data and visualizations and, and, and maps, et cetera, to help communicate the impacts of climate risk and adaptation back to the community? So the, the, the information flow in the other direction again. Do you have a feel for how important geospatial data is for that communication and awareness raising part of the puzzle? Yes, I, I, I think it's it's really important. Well, of course, the classical example are these flood models and how you can visualize different types of scenarios, for example, sea level rise, but also for stormwater flooding, which is a more of an issue for the city of Helsinki. And and to really uh, re how, to, how to show both the decision makers, but also the citizens and uh, uh, what, for example, a catastrophic rain event would have would cause in our city, because it's it's still is a kind of a distant uh, possibility because uh, the uncertainties are so large, but then then the consequences could be very very large and and then there are other other one of course urban planners they are used with maps so uh, communicating any issue to them is the map is the best way to do it so uh, and we've realized that so uh, we we are very we we try to use maps a lot um, for the citizens um, uh, they are not always as as good uh, but then uh, luckily there are 3D city models and so on, which can be very, very good. And those are developed in the city quite strongly now. Then, and we are really uh, eager to see the results of those. So yes, important, definitely. Thank you, Susanna. So we've, we've only got a minute or so left. So I think maybe just a quick, um, couple of word answer for, from each of you on what are the what do you think the, the main challenges are we had this in the mentee but in your particular part of uh, the, the climate resilience puzzle what do you think the main geospatial data challenge is that you're facing if you could say that in a, in a sentence or two that would be great and we'll, we'll start with Jade please no pressure um, so if I talk from a northern Ireland perspective we often get left out of things so I guess it's kind of being pulled into those bigger projects better and also getting that because we need the baseline data basically and then that translated into action and then decision makers to take those actions forward so yeah thanks and I'll follow up that that offer with the open glim project Andrew <laughs> what do you think the main geospatial data challenge we face is or are you face in your sector I, I think it's just that matching as I said in my talk so I think it's finding the the match between um, really robust things that we can say with with a good deal of confidence, and then the, and then the scale that people actually need that information on, and finding where those things match, I think is is a real challenge. Thanks, and Rachel. A couple of sentences on, on your challenges. Yeah, thanks. I was quite surprised with the mentee results on this question. Actually, that availability was the one that the audience thinks is. Um, sort of the key challenge but for me there's quite a lot of data available and, and the key challenge is really translating that into something that's usable for for other users thank you finally Susanna maybe a word or two since we're, we're nearly out of time what's the main challenge that you face in Helsinki yeah uh, well um, I can talk of the whole of the city but that I think easy to use um, tools 
from from this uh, from uh, where the data is incorporated and and transparency of the data as well because we have data from different sources and different tools and so on yes good point to finish on transparency okay so thank you very much indeed to to our panel and to our audience for um a, a very lively discussion and hopefully a, a deep exploration of the the role of geospatial data in climate resilience work. I'd like to thank you all um, sincerely for your contributions. Um, uh, now that the our session is coming to a close, I'd like to encourage everybody who was watching this event either live or in the recorded uh, version after the event to engage with us and, and use this as an opportunity to network. You can do this on the KTN event platform uh, where you can find the attendee list and find, use that to discuss with, with other attendees and arrange one-to-one -one meetings, et cetera, or send us messages. And please take that opportunity, visit the, um, the UK Climate Resilience Programme information booth in the, in the virtual pavilion. Um, so that's all I want to say now. And thank you for, for everyone for attending the event today. I hope it was uh, a worthwhile and an interesting discussion. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the KTN Spatial Geospatial Virtual Pavilion and enjoy COP. Thanks everyone. Bye for now.